Hess Bank is a bit like Not End, really, only with more money and the occasional Fleetwood-style faded Edwardian terrace thrown in. The canal here deliberately follows the shoreline to make it more accessible for those loading shrimps straight from the briny onto barges back in the old times. The houses of Hess Bank are trim and expensive looking and stacked in neat layers up the hillside overlooking the basin of Morecambe Bay. Amongst them squats the Hest Bank Inn, originally called the Sands Inn. Licensed to brew its own mead, hold cockfights and serve victuals as long ago as 1554. During the Civil War, or so it's said, not unlike every other pub in Lancashire to be honest, it was occupied by Cromwell's troops. In 1792, the innkeeper shot and wounded the highwayman Edmund Gross. Gross was later hung at Lancaster Castle, his corpse filled with tar and stretched on a gibbet on the Hesbank's Hanging Green, where it remained for several years as a tourist attraction. In 1799, the Lantern Room was added to the inn to help guide coaches across the treacherous Morecambe Bay Sands. More than 130 people were rescued in total over the years, until the opening of the Furness Railway fortuitously killed the coaching industry off completely. In 1830, the inn became a centre of sporting excellence, offering wrestling, pace egging, maypole dancing, duck shooting, and possibly the only sport I'd ever stand a chance at, steak eating. Before we find ourselves too bogged down with just one building, the guides, and one or two of the brownies as well, refer to the rest of Hess Bank as a village. But down near the railway line, where the Chinese takeaway cowers from the busy main road, it feels more like a suburb of St. Anne's. It's stretching the term village thinner than James Corden's underpants elastic, to be fair. Somewhere towards the northern end of Hest Bank, Although it's difficult to know where Hest Bank ends and Bolton the Sands begins, the pair of them running together as seamlessly as the notches on Eric Pickle's belt. If you're travelling by canal, you'll encounter Bridge 120. As you probably gathered, this is no ordinary bridge. It's a manually operated swing bridge, which you've probably also gathered from our abundant use of stills photography, is impossible to film and operate at the same time. Other than adding a bit of adventure for the casual tourist, it's quite frankly a nuisance if you live on a narrow boat. Onwards to Bolton Le Sands, which has a French le in the middle of it. It was recorded as Bodle Tone in the Doomsday Book, which sounds like some sort of 1960s German record player. As already mentioned, it's hard to say where Hess Bank runs out and Bolton the Sands picks up the slack. The two places run into each other with the same ill-defined borders as Michael Gove's face. It would probably be accurate, however, to define Bolton the Sands as less Hess Bank's nouveau riche estate-driven suburb and more its own old money character filled village. More accurate, but grammatically messy. Despite its crumbling Miss Marple-esque feel, there's surprisingly little history to be had. In fact, the Victoria County history, the go-to reference for such matters, has only this to say. The history of the place is destitute of any very noteworthy event. What stories once existed now lie entombed within the architecture. The oldest church, for example, is the Anglican Holy Trinity, aka St. Michael's. Its tower dating back to 1500, its list of rectors to 1216. Its graveyard runs down to the canal bank where its gravestones erupt in crooked rows, like a shark's teeth after a pummeling by a blue whale, and leer through the brambles at passing boats. Inside the church are two Viking sculptures, guesstimated to date from the 900s or thereabouts. One's the fragment of a cross, the other's what's left of a hogsback, similar to the more complete hogsback stored in Hesham Church. Its history might be obfuscated by the passage of time, but the village appears to be riddled with ghosts. For example, the marsh at Bolton the Sands is said to be haunted by a girl called Matilda, who succumbed to a bout of Blatt de Signor, look it up, 
This is a family film on the eve of her wedding. Devastated by this turn of events, she disappeared into Morecambe Bay, still wearing her wedding dress. Her ghost still roams the marsh, despite her fiancé hiring an assassin to avenge her death. How successful he was, history doesn't record. Another female phantom with a grudge against the opposite sex, although in the latter's case the motives remain unknown, haunts the aforementioned canal. She's believed to have drowned there under mysterious circumstances, and now dedicates her afterlife to luring unsuspecting but presumably very lonely men to their deaths in the water. Apparently. If that's not ghoulish enough, then somewhere along the main thoroughfare through Bolton the Sands, although exactly where we couldn't honestly say, which is why we've opted for generic footage, stands the Boggart House, a building reckoned by the owl folk to have witnessed murder most foul, along with numerous other deeds of darkness. According to the Lancaster Gazette of January the 25th, 1851, not a few who had great pretensions to fearlessness when coming into proximity with the Boggart House have felt themselves compelled to whistle to keep their courage up. Numerous are the forms in which this supernatural agent presents itself, sometimes as a headless soldier, a gigantic sheep, or a monster goose. Regular viewers will no doubt be aware that we like gigantic sheep, headless soldiers and monster geese at Lancashire Footnotes. As the article continues, last week the Dobby made its appearance again, much to the terror of an inoffensive carter who was proceeding on this way to Kendall Market. To cut a long-winded and, to be honest, atrociously written story short, the carter was passing the Boggart house at the stroke of midnight, when his horse became spooked by what appeared to be a sheep blocking the road ahead. Naturally, the carter struck said sheep with his whip, as you do, at which point it swelled to the size of a house, and giving him a look of ineffable contempt, burst into flames before flying off. You don't get out like that on Most Haunted. Apparently, the poor carter was petrified. The chattering of his teeth almost rivaled in noise by the bone playing of the celebrated Juba. His knees shook and his legs refused to perform their office. To be fair, you don't get newspaper articles like that anymore either. On which spine-chilling note, please click like, subscribe and do all the usual stuff to prevent YouTube from evicting us, and with a lot of luck, we'll return again shortest with another thrilling episode of Lancashire Footnotes.